Excellent. I'm the last talk. I know we want to get on with the game storming and then get to dinner, so I will be as quick as I can. Um, obviously, I've talked about Biosim Space a bit, but I thought the easiest way to explain it is to just show it to you. So this is Biosim Space running in the Jupyter Notebook. I assume we all know what Jupyter Notebooks are. I'm going to execute the cells in the Jupyter Notebook as we go through. So this is basically, it's going to load up, can we read this as well from the back? Good. It's going to load up a couple of uh, AMBA files. This is actually a quad on the top file. It could have been Gromax files, could have been PSF files, could have been anything. I don't care what the file format is. Now we have a molecular system represented in memory with a data format. How many molecules? 631. This is a small little demo. Here, I now define protocol for running an equilibration MD simulation. So we worked out what are the key things in various MD packages which are user wants. So I don't, the users don't really care about the integrators, they don't care about all the low-level details. They want to know how long am I running it for, what temperatures are we going for, am I restraining protein backbones, etc. So we define a protocol, and now that's the data format in memory. And then what we do is we say, we've got a system, we've got a protocol, run it. It's now found on this particular cloud, it happens to have Sander available, it's now running a Sander simulation. Could have been Gromax, could have been NAMD, could have been PMMD, could have been SOMD. It doesn't matter, the same thing is actually running the simulation. Is it running? Yes. It's currently running in the cloud. It's got the resource, it's put all the data across, it's written all the input files, it's running everything. How long has it been going for? 0.4 minutes. But because this is running in the cloud, and we can actually understand the data files and convert them back into our data model, I can query it. So data is being written from the simulation, so what's the energy? Oh, problems, it's now 6,300 kcals per mole. What's the energy now? 6,354. We can do this line because it's running interactively, but just the energy, that's boring, that looks quite rubbish, so let's get more data. It's now been going for 0 0.0076 nanoseconds. That's the energy, that's the temperature, that's the energy, and if I run this again, voila, it's a new value. What do we have now? We have data changing with time, when you have data changing the time, what should we do next with it? Make a graph. Voila, this is a live graph of how the temperature is changing through the simulation, and a live graph of the energy. And if I then rerun this cell, this is just using standard Matplotlib, pandas, etc. it live updates. But graphs, kind of old school, two-dimensional. We've already heard that we have NGL view, so with NGL view, let's get the latest snapshot out from the simulation. And with this latest snapshot, there we are. 3D interactive. What it means is we're not moving data backwards and forwards between my laptop and between the cloud. It's all just happening live in the cloud. I've just got a little bit of something in my eye. <laughs> Obviously, because I'm so amazed this is working. <laughs> <laughs> it's a live demo when it's working. And again, I will emphasize, NGLV is amazing. And then because of that, I didn't have to write any of this. We did not write most of this, I should emphasize. This is all using the tools and standard libraries. It did not take us long to write it. This is not the end of the project. We're only about halfway through the project. We've got tons of time to go. What else? Well, we're producing trajectory. Data is being written to the cloud. So let's get a handle on that data. We now have a handle on that data. How many trajectory frames have been written? Eight. Let's now get them. This has now got the data. And this is actually an MD trad piece. This is an MD trad object. I could have asked for the data in MD analysis format. So again, we're not building new things. It's just tying together the existing tools. And now that I have an MD analysis or MD trad piece of data, let's plot the RMSD from that. Voila, that's currently the RMSD of my really rubbish simulation. It's running in the cloud, but it also runs on local machines. It also runs on big clusters. As you notice, it's Python. It works because we have a data model. Now this is MD, is where we started, but we weren't writing this to run MD. We're writing this because we want to run lots of different types of simulations. In particular, what we're running at the moment, this is where magically it won't work. Come on, come on, spinning wheel of death. <laughs> Still spinning wheel of death, there we are. It's a little dicky MacBook. Ultimately, what we want to do is run protein liquid binding frenzy calculations. So that's really where our, our bread and butter is. And as John mentioned, there's a D3R challenge at the moment. So we have basically ligands, we have proteins, and we've got to predict the binding free energies. And hopefully, they won't be totally rubbish when we get the real experimental data back. And so what you've really got here is you have input data, which are your ligands, because we're doing relative binding free energies, so we have two different ligands. We have a protein going in, 
and there's this magical black box, and when you put this input data into the magical black box, out will come the relative binding for energy, and it will be right, and everyone will be happy. Now, when we come to sort of sharing molecular data, it's really the question of how do I share the protocols and the data flows of the magical black box? We have put the scripts on GitHub, but what should we be sharing? The input files, the input and all of the output data, all of those things, and it becomes difficult when if we look inside the magical black box, it actually looks like that. You have to set up the ligands, which means basically throwing them through anti-chain, palm check, tea leap, aligning them together with fine MCS, doing a GMX solvate for solvation, tea leap for the protein, SANDA for minimization, PUNDQ for doing some equilibration, SOMD for doing the free energy calculations using OpenMM, then into analyze free energy to pull the data out to get one relative delta G. And that's one free energy that you're getting, and we're actually going to do, well, we are doing this, but back 50 relative binding for energy, so it's 50 times this. Now, I, we do, we publish the scripts for this, but the scripts for this, if you do it traditionally, will work with these tools and only these tools and these versions of these tools. Nobody else could reproduce this workflow in two years' time because they might not have that software installed. What you really want to do is publish the script so that if somebody comes along and they don't have these pieces of software installed, it will still work with RDKit Smiles, it will still work with Tea Loop, it will still work with GMX MD1, it will still do bulk free energies with PMD CUDA. That's what you want, is the ability to share workflows where we can flip easily between different equivalents, have different file formats for the inputs, etc. And we did it. This is a biosim space script that parameterizes a ligand using a wide variety of different tools. This, slightly smaller, is a biosim space script which does a relative binding for energy with a wide variety of different tools. By sharing these Python scripts, which is what are on the website, if you have biosim space installed and you have the underlying tools installed, then you'll be able to reproduce our D3R one. And if you can beat us by next Wednesday, it's all live now, you can submit a better answer than we will. We took the view when we did Biosim Space that our job is not to come up with the XKCD perfect file format. Our job was to look at what exists already, recognize that all of our tools have different shapes and so they don't fit together perfectly, and so our job is to build what we call the shims. So anyone with an engineering background knows that when you engineer stuff, it really doesn't fit together well, and so you end up putting little bits of metal between it, and those are the shims. They're the things that fill the gaps up, make sure that the rockets don't explode, and as ultimately, that's what Biosim Space is. It's file format interconverters and things that join together lots of tools. Now, we designed these to work with all the standard packages, and we designed them following seven design principles, the seven sacred design principles of Biosim Space. One, if you are writing a file format reader, it better be able to read and write the same things. I see so many tools that come out that can either write the file format or read the file format, but they can't read and write the file format. And even those that can read and write the file format, oh, things are difficult. So one, anything that goes in, these are the supported file formats, we have many, many more, we read and write and it's symmetrical. So everything we can read, we can, everything we can read, we can write. Next design principle, information is preserved. That means if you read something in from here, when it goes into the data model, so we have data models which is system or molecule. Every piece of data from this file format is precious and it must be contained in the data model. You do not throw away anything from these files when it goes into the data model. We even know what the file names are, where they come from, that bit of data. It goes into the data model. And that means that when we have the data, we can then write it back to the file. And assuming you put in, say, a Gromax top, you write it as a Gromax top, and then you basically read it again, you should have the same data going around. And you check this. You check this by actually doing things like comparing the energies of the molecular systems that you've loaded. So we calculate the energy in Gromax. We load it up. We have an internal thing that can calculate energies because it's really important that a molecular file parser can actually calculate energies. We calculate the energy in our internal parser, compare it to the energy in Gromax, Write it out, read it back, make sure the energy is same, make sure the energy still agrees with Gromax, write it out in amber, 
read the energy back in in PMMD, make sure the energy agrees. It's really hard to get files which have the same energy in Gromax and Amber. Really difficult. But when we've got this, it's all unit tests, of course, automatically running all the time. It knows you to do triangular transformations. So literally, you can read it in Gromax, write it out in Amber, write it out in PSF, read it back in as PSF. And through these cycles, as you're changing between molecular file formats, you should always have the same energy, the same data. You should never throw data away. Design principle number three, don't be too clever. Being clever is the enemy of pretty much every piece of software ever written by the whole of humankind. I really hate software that tries to be clever. Say, for example, I load up an Amber Rust file. That Amber Rust file definitely cannot be written as a Gromax top file, because this is coordinate data, this is topology information. Throw, raise an exception, tell people straight away. If there is information that I need to go here, which is not available here, don't guess it. Don't think the user may be missed something. I'll helpfully try and suggest with Clippy something that might help you. Just say, no, I can't do it. It's about ambiguity. Only do the transformations which are completely ambiguous. But hang on a minute. I've been sort of telling you about this data structure that we load things up to in memory. What exactly is it? What is molecule? Molecule is a collection of property-derived objects. So everything in the system is derived from property. And molecule is a key value, diction key value dictionary of properties. So for example, charge zero is a key for the value atom charges. Atom charges is a data, mod data object which contains the char partial charges in all the atoms. LJ is a key for the atom LJs, data object that contains all the LJs parameters. Element. Atom elements, data object that contains all the atom elemental data. Mass, masses, connectivity, connectivity, bond, two atom functions. Angle, three atom functions, dihedral, four atom functions. is a key value dictionary. But the key thing with this key value dictionary is that it's completely arbitrary. I can add whatever keys I want. If I want a key called fluffy cat and I associate it with atom LJs, that's a perfectly valid molecule. We don't do ontology. It's a container that can contain arbitrary data. We're not telling people what to name it. But this means that when we do relative binding for energy calculations, we can have charge zero and charge one to represent two states of charges. We could call elements, elements, silly name, atom masses, etc. What we also do is make sure that molecule is itself a property. And because molecule is a property, that means that molecules can contain molecules. So then you can actually say, what was the reference molecule? Where did this come from? When I parameterized this, what was the original molecule that came from the PDB? Let's save that in the molecule. And then let's take this one stage further. And actually, molecule is not actually the thing you're holding. What you're holding is molecule data. Molecule data is the thing that holds all of the data of the molecule. And molecule is just a view of the data when you view the entire molecule at once. Atom is another view of the data, but we're viewing only one atom. Residue is a view of the data where you're only viewing one residue. And what it means is you're actually doing the model view controller way of working with things, where the model is the data model, what molecule data, the view is your molecule, atom, residue, chain, segment, cut group, who cares what, and the controller is actually we have editor versions of these. Because once you've loaded it, edit it, add atoms, change things, merge things together, we let you do all of that. So that's molecule, what is system? System shock horror is yet another property. A molecule could contain an entire system if it wanted to, but it's much better to have the system containing molecules. The system contains properties, so it's space is a periodic box. Periodic box, again, is a property. Time is a time. All is a molecule group. A molecule group, shock horror, is a property that contains lots of molecules. And so all is all of the molecules in the system. But because the data format actually does implicit sharing, it means that protein can contain just the molecules in the system that we designate as being protein, but the molecule data is not actually duplicated. The molecule is still only there once. So the system understands the concept underneath of what is the same data. So you end up tagging data all over the place, aggregating it, sharing it, blah, blah, blah. And as I said, system is a property, so that means that one system can contain their own systems, which can contain molecules, which can contain systems, which can infinitely go on in an inception recursion but as a data format, we don't mind. So this brings us now to design principle four. 
Design principle four, don't change anything. If the user gives you something, don't change it, because the user gave it to you for a reason. They liked it. You start messing around with it, they're going to get shirty. So if they give you a Gromax topology coordinate file, and they want you to run MD on it, give them back a Gromax topology coordinate file. Don't give them back an Ampapal top file, because that will surprise them. <laughs> So this means, if I only have PMMD CUDA on my system and they give me Gromax files, just translate it into Amber Top CRUD behind the scenes, run the simulation, the Amber comes back out, oh, we managed to save the original file format as a key value pair in our system, so we know it needs to come out as a Grotop, so pop it out as a Grotop. That way you can take an existing node in the workflow, the same file format goes in, our file format goes out, we've replaced it with our own code, and no one is any the wiser. But this goes further with don't change anything. This person's a bit silly. They've got alanine 5, arginine 5, hip 20, and rtf 15 as their residue names and numbers. We all know that's rubbish. And indeed, if you try and throw that through PMD CUDA, PMD will say that's not really nice because I want contiguously numbered residues and I want to clean everything up, blah, blah, blah. But the user had a reason for being so silly with the way they were naming their residues. And so when you go through this process, you map what the original residue names and numbers were. So when you run it through the tool, you can restore what the user gave you. Again, you don't change the residue numbers. Who here has had it when they've run an MD package and suddenly all the residue numbers have changed behind the scenes and suddenly you've been analysing the wrong things? Again, don't change anything. Don't change anything also implies to don't add things. If a user gives you a molecule that is missing hydrogens, it is not because they forgot the hydrogens, it's because they really want to simulate something without hydrogens. If you behind the back add hydrogens to it, then that's going to confuse them. If you really need something and it doesn't exist in the input, you're missing that information, raise an exception, tell the user they need to supply more information. Don't automatically go back and add the information so the simulation will run. Again, this is really design principle three of don't be too clever. You have a lot of trust in the user capability. <laughs> you do, but this is actually where you end up having like pre-filters in, and the tools underneath should not be dealing with silly users. That's the ambiguous layer that's done by your user interface. When you've gone through the user interface, then we're into a world where you do exactly what you've been told to do. Design principle five, store general write specific. We have a complete computer algebra system built into this package. Because way back when, we needed this for Monte Carlo simulations. This means we store the intramolecular potential terms as algebra. It is literally represented as 1.3 times r minus 0 0.034 squared. I can differentiate it, I can integrate it, I can do whatever I want to it. And we have an API that enables you to search the algebraic expression and work out how to convert it into different forms. This means all of these bonds and angles and dihedrals are stored as algebra, and only when I need to write it out as Gromax file do we actually try and create a Gromax bond object which inspects the equation and goes, is it one of the types of bonds in Gromax that we support? If it is, this is the data structure of a Gromax bond, it only has three parameters, four parameters and a function type. It's only at the point of writing we create something specific, and again, for Amber, this is an Amber bond, it only has two links, because Amber's got very limited bond potentials in comparison. But by doing this, it means you don't burden the underlying data structure with artifacts of the program, because you're storing general write local. You'll be happy I've grouped these two together. Design principle six, units are important. Numbers do not exist in isolation, as we are taught in high school. Your numbers have units, so all numbers, all you things, actually have to have units attached. And so we have a complete uniting system in there, a complete uniting system where you can do algebra on the units. That means you can literally write 3.5 times kcal divided by mol times angstrom times angstrom, and it works. And the reason why this is so fundamentally important is if you're trying to write a program that can read Gromax topology files and Amber topology files, you have to deal with SI and ACMA, and naturally you have a horrible mess if you're not actually dealing with the fact that unit systems are different. Design principle seven is just don't just assume ask, and again, it's the same thing. If you're missing formal charges and you need it, ask the user, don't try and calculate it. 
Whatever is input is complete. Don't add hydrogens that are missing because the user may have asked for it. Don't do things behind the user's back because you assume they were stupid, because your program is more stupid than your users. Raise an exception if you can't deal with what you've got. Tell the person they've got an error. And again, this is really related to DP3 and 4, which is don't be too clever and don't change anything. Now, this is all beautifully implemented in C++ with Python wrapping. So it means you have a full Python API and a full C++ API. Very easy to install-ish. Will be more easy after we submit the D3R results because we're publishing the whole thing so people can reproduce our D3R calculation, which I'm assuming will be not working because it's binding for energies. But we have a lot of challenges. This all assumes that tools which are underneath are interchangeable when they're not. The underlying tools choose different places to store or represent key information. For example, Shake. That's how amber represents shake. It puts an additional bond between the hydrogens. Gromax, you put in your rigid water model, and then you define it in one of three different locations, depending on what mood you're in. And it's basically an if, if not death flexible block, or an algorithm of shake, or whatever you want to do. So actually working out where the information needs to be, what is molecular data, and what is configuration data, simulation data, is very difficult. Other challenge, the underlying tools are not modular. I would really like to solvate my protein using solvate from TLEAP because, sorry, GMX solvate, you do a pretty poor job compared to TLEAP solvate. TLEAP solvate is brilliant. Unfortunately, TLEAP solvate, you've got to parameterize the protein and solvate. You can't separate those two stages. And that's annoying because you think, okay, you just parameterize the protein, it doesn't matter. But what if my protein doesn't have any parameters in amber? I've suddenly got a problem, particularly if I'm actually working with a protein that's already been parameterized in Chromax. It's like it's a complete waste, but they should, should be modular and they're not modular enough. The tools are not robust. If I take the same input protocol and the same input files and I run them with PMMD, the simulation will crash for shake errors. But if I run it with Sander, it's fine. If I run it with Chromax, it's fine. So we don't have sufficient robustness in the tools, but you can just drag and drop different tools in behind a standard protocol. And then there isn't a perfect match of algorithms. We can run, and once we finish the D3R run with um, SOMD, we're going to run D3R again, but using Gromax and using PMD CUDA. They will give different answers. And they'll give different answers because they have different implementations of different integrators, different shake algorithms, different force fields, different PMEs, different cutoff schemes. I could go on and on and on. These codes are not drag and drop replaceable. So there is no point trying to create reproducibility if they're going to change codes. And indeed, because they keep updating themselves, they're not even drag and drop replaceable from version to version. So we've built something that does this. We hope it's going to, well, it's running at the moment, and we should hopefully finish and submit in time for next Thursday. These are the scripts that are running. You can download them from our D3R website. And just to thank the Biosim Space Research Team, it's actually a big collaboration, which is CCD Biosim and Heck Biosim, together with collaborations going out with many pharma companies involved. But as with all of these things, we have these beautiful pyramids. And at the bottom of the pyramid, the two people doing the work are Lester Hedges, he's my research software engineer, and Tony May and Julianne Scree. Many, many links if you want to begin looking at it and playing with it. It's not the solution to the problem, it's just a picture of what a solution, and the inspiration for what a solution could be. Thank you. Time for one quick question. Maybe explain a lot of, of uh, things. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, there is some other packages and uh, like HTMD, so I guess it's not doing the same. Can you comment a bit of you, yeah, how you can comment uh, different packages and compare different views? So I think there are lots of different packages, and what we deliberately took the view of the Biosim space is we we're not going to try, we're not going to reinvent something. So if a tool exists, we will try and use the tool. So we didn't do anything with trajectory analysis because there's already empty analysis and empty trash. We also took the view that we don't want to disrupt somebody's workflow. So this is why we're focusing on workflow nodes, where whatever was your input file and your input description, that should work with our node, and we give out the same formats as you wanted to give as input. So in theory, if you have an existing nine workflow in industry, for example, which is who our partners are with, you could just pluck out something that was currently doing a hard-coded batch script to run 
nan d, and then you can just pull it in a bias in space node, and in theory, it will keep working in the same way, because it's the same formats, the same output formats. Um, but generally, it's, we very much don't see this as replacing anything. It's about fitting in with a community of other tools, and in terms of longevity, the actual underlying code that has been going for about 12 years now, we just haven't been very noisy about what we can do. Um, and we have long-term plans of how it works. The actual software itself is built on top of something which is we now work with Microsoft, Google, and uh, Oracle with for this huge cloud project. Where actually you'll be able to have simulations. I showed the notebooks running. If you look at my talk slide, you'll see actually what's happening is that data is being put on object stores, computers being allocated on the cloud next to the object stores. They're all running. You have an identity service, an accounting service, an access service, which is enabling you to pay for simulations up front, pay for the storage of data, pay for the long-term archiving of data, and moving us to this world where instead of you log on to a cluster in SSH and ASYNC and do things like that, it's all interactive notebooks. And you can then give a DOI to the notebook, publish that, and then you have an executable paper that contains the description, all the input, grabbing all the resource, all the analysis, all the graphics, all the conclusions. And that's the kind of 2025 vision that we're moving towards. All right, let's thank Chris again.